the earliest mm -hmm. memory was they're making a big deal out of it. Um, there's no way it's this bad. Um, but this was not me looking into any information. It was just off the top, you know. Um, I was not a public health anything at that time. I was a data analyst working from home. Um, so my initial reaction was, oh, it'll blow over. There's no way, no way this big. Um, and that really was my initial reaction. And then when we went into quarantine, um, I'm like, wow, this is, I, I really need to start paying attention. Um, but I was starting to get in, uh, bogged down by work, um, cause we were an outsourcing company, uh, for HR and our offices were in India. So as this was evolving into an issue greater and greater, we started learning, okay, this is, this is getting bigger. Um, it impacted the office, we shut that down. And then I had to learn their job. Um, so I was just inundated with stress and my, my own life situation and everything at the time that I wasn't really going outside of that easy convenience of information mm -hmm. to understand it myself. Um, and then I did. I, I can't remember why. Um, I think it was a documentary because I watched the Science Channel. You know, I'm, I'm really into going to the source. I knew that. I knew, you know, I'm, I'm not going to listen to news. I'm not going to listen to all these talking heads. I'm going to go to the source. And I did. I found a documentary um, from the Science Channel, you know, from the scientist that mm -hmm. I knew I could trust. Then I learned. And then I understood, yes, this is significant. This is unprecedented. I need to get vaccinated. Um, they didn't have the vaccination yet. They were still developing it, but I knew that as soon as it came available, I was going to get it. Was there particular um, information that really helped you make that decision for a particular individual? It was basically just hearing the scientists um, explain it, you know, and and and. I, it it was removed from bias. It was it was not the the journalists. They were the officials. I don't remember all their names, you know. But you know the head of the CDC and Michael whatever, and you know I don't even. Know yeah. But um. Yes. Yeah. Uh. So here and I I do I have faith in that because I I need to you know I've gotten all my other vaccines. Mm -hmm. Um. They protected me. Uh, and I know that people that don't get the vaccines, they are more likely to get sick. And I was a person that don't, I don't even get the flu vaccines um, because I have always, always believed oh, I'm going to get sick from it because that one time I did. That one time I did and I didn't want to do it again. So I've kind of had that same mentality of a lot of people prior, but I was willing to listen to people who knew better than I did. And I put my faith in that. How did that align with your contract with other people in your community? Well, my husband and I were on the same path um, from the beginning. Like we both were skeptical. You know, it was almost like we were twins at the, at, at, at the advent of it. Um, and then as I developed my information from the sources, he was he was digesting it as well uh, and uh, adapted it. To Okay, yeah, this is Daria, and, wow. and we have two children, so we had to make sure that we were we were telling them. Um, my son's older, so of course he was more skeptical because uh, he was on social media hearing things. Um, but I made my children watch the same documentary because um, I felt like it was really uh, condensed, comprehensive information that had the facts in it, and um, and yeah, so that was okay um and then it was my family my you know external family uh that they weren't alone my brother still is anti-vaxxer apparently very political and very um which really drove a wedge between us um so yeah like but we don't we don't have as much outside um interactions because I was working from home, you know, so I didn't really have like this broad base of a social life. Well, my, we're military, so we were previously living in Germany, 
you know, so we were only here for not even two years and this happened. Um, so we were still like kind of trying to get to know our neighborhood and, you know, developing groups where we were and then we we're kind of isolated. So how, how did you see um, the outside of the situation with the community? Did you see COVID that community? Did you see a marked impact on the Structurally, well, my kids' school, so that was the, one of the biggest impacts. Um, so, my daughter was 10, nine at the time, and um, you know, she had to do online learning, which was difficult for me because I was tied to my dad, like, this was not information. You know, I was doing data analytics and I was doing COBRA. I was doing all these processes that required me being there and I couldn't help her. Um, so it was a struggle because I had to just trust that she was going to do it and do with my son. And it was, it was horrible because it was like, I have to be downstairs. They're upstairs. I walk in. They're sleeping, not paying attention. And you're like, I don't know what to do. I, I, you have to, you know. And then you're like, you can't have school in your room. You have to be here. And it was that was the impact that I saw. Like community wise, I wasn't really outside. You know, I, I to walk my dog. Um, you know, and I would talk to neighbors that way. But I wasn't. I wasn't out in the stores. You know, I was keeping myself locked down and safe. Um, so yeah, the biggest impact was my kids not being in school and then just feeling like, you know, I can't even help them in their education. I, I'm doing this. It was, yeah, it was a lot. So you were anticipating getting that new for the fact that it became available for young people um, to read and find new kids up to Yep. Yes, I was. Yes, I was. Despite what they were saying, I knew there's always a chance of a risk with any medicine that you're going to put into somebody, depending on their biological makeup, you know? So you can't really generalize that to the masses. Um, unless that has already been established by the, the professionals and the experts, you know, because they do have that trust in them. They, they, they should know what they're doing. And I'm like, somebody's got to trust that. Um, so, yeah, I, uh, as soon as it was available, I got my daughter, well, my son, he was, I guess he was 17, 18, but he was, he didn't want to get it. And I said, you're getting it. I, I'm sorry that you feel like you're not going to get it, but that's why I hadn't watched the the documentary and I'm like you know you got to protect yourself I've given you every vaccination that they um required or suggested and I'm I'm not going to stop now um when you did get your vaccination um I got, yeah so I had to go to the um meta uh whatever they were calling it over there Okay. Um, yeah, the mega site. So I went to Rowan down in um in South Jersey, mm -hmm. uh there. And, that, and then my son went to another mega site. Um my daughter obviously that was later and that had to go at the uh what was it, her pediatrician? No. It's like Walgreens or, mm -hmm. or CVS or one of them. Um how was the process getting you back to the first the first round was difficult because you had to find the site you had to make the well yeah you had to make the appointment and then you had to wait in line um so it was inconvenient but it was doable you know like once you were like okay I'm going to get it where you're going to go um the second I think the booster was the hardest after that because it was like where am I going to get it I gotta find an appointment oh they don't have any because of course I was wanting to get it as soon as it was available um but yeah, I didn't really, I didn't have too many hiccups. I know a lot of people did, but it was very accessible for us. And um, when you think about kind of moving forward from next week, what do you think of, you know, kind of the most lasting um, impression from COVID? For me, um, 
damn it, being hy hygienically aware, really, and just uh, cover, not, you know, like covering my cough, covering my nose in the right spot, not touching my, my hands to my face, not putting my hands in my mouth. Like, it's a lot of those things that um, I was germ aware before, uh, but now I, I just have this immense um, mindfulness and awareness that, you know, the first um, prevention to disease is to just not put your hands in your mouth, make sure your hands are clean, make sure you're washing your hands. Um, so like my big takeaway from this is like, okay, now we have to be even more health conscious. Um, you know, I'm a student now, so I'm learning still mm -hmm. about environmental issues and health. Um, and I'm learning that we are the cause to a lot of our demise. Uh, so a big takeaway from that is, you know, just how our, how humans are being and how are we interacting with each other? Are we caring and valuing each other to give us our space, not cough out loud, you know, and not just sneeze and not cover up and, you know, not just think it's okay to be biting your fingernails and then shaking somebody's hand. Um, they're, they're pretty much like where I am. Like, yeah. Yeah. Real, really tactile you know, prevention. Yeah. Um, so you made the decision that you're in public health. You missed a pandemic. Yep. Did that make it a driver for you or was it something you had planned on doing before? Or I actually wasn't, no, I, I was on the road to get my, my degree in information systems management, um, in Germany, but we moved. So this has been, you know, the way of my life. Um, and then I was like, I can't work at this job anymore. This is even though I'm good at it, don't want to do it. This, I don't want to sit. I want to do something else. Um, and then I just started thinking, like, what I like, I like, I like my nutrition class. I'm really motivated by that, and I really wanted to teach people what I was learning. Um, so you know, I kind of did like a, I'll be a gym teacher. I'll be a yoga instructor. And and then my my husband got me this book called The Change Maker. And it asked a lot of questions about, you know, what do you want? What, you, what are you passionate about? Um, and through that, I was able to be like, okay, I want to get, I want to get in public health. I think, I think this will really um, help other people. And I want to be an agent of change. And I want to get, take my knowledge and I want to give it to the community to, to empower them, build them up. Um, and, and then, and then it was just a matter of finding the program. And, and as soon as I did, I quit my job. I gave them like two months notice and I quit and entered Rowan and just got on the path to public health. And every time I I'm learning more and more, I, my passion just grows more and more, um, because there's just so many things that are broken and somebody's got to fix it. Not that I'm going to, but at least I'm going to have a loud enough mouth to make it you know, a parent and, and maybe give somebody else more inspiration. So yeah, like the COVID, um, you know, I was one of them great resignations or whatever, but it was more than that. It was just being able to finally say, okay, this is not really where I want to be. This is what's really needed. And it kind of magnified that as it did for everything. Oh, we're certainly looking at coming into the field. This conference has talked a lot about the awareness of the gap in equity. Um, and if you think about COVID and impact on the broader community, what do you think we need right now? Yeah. Oh, my goodness, oh, the list goes on. Um, you know, I'm struggling with this myself because I wanted to get into education because I feel like, you know, if we can get the, the right information to our children of our generation um, that helps them be a good human and helps them understand uh, the climate that we live in and understand other people and how other people are, that that would bring them, bring them to a level of a good playing field, you know, but without education that's affordable, you can't really get them all there. So, and then I, I'm thinking about the environment. Well, we're, we're destroying our environment. Um, so if we can start making the government accountable for funding and supporting this, then maybe, maybe that can raise this up. Maybe then we can come out of this because at least we're caring about everybody. But it's just at, like, 
I, I always say, I don't know where I can make the most impact or what part of it because public health is everything. Um, and then with all the um, exasperated disparities that came out of COVID, you definitely know this is this is all based on structural racism. So where where are you going to be able to make the biggest impact? So I struggle with that because I'm like, well, it's not the policymakers. The policymakers are the ones that are going to do this, but it's those advocacy and those act activists and the people that are going to speak up is really what's going to change it. It's just, you know, being here, I was I always want to hear the solutions and not the problems. Um, and there, it's hard to find here because, but they did say it, it's the government. We need the government buy-in, you know? We just, we need them to invest in the people of this country, the world, and really help us get to that health equity um, and level that playing field. Give people the ones that need the most, more, and the ones that have it all, don't give as much, you know? but that's socialism, some people can call it, you know, so you get in space about that, but definitely somebody needs to um, get these policymakers um, to stop being so greedy and driven by capitalism, really, like, they need to be patient-centered, people, you know, like, yeah, it can be in the medical, but it really has to be at the core of our country and really be the driver, is what I think. It's really insightful. Um, so, again, great to have you come out here to your new life experience, your lived experience. Um, anything else that you'd like to add on um, how you see this project? I think the important message to carry You know, I think we just we do need to trust in the people that do study. Um, medicine and science and innovative technologies that really are there to help us. Um, environmentalists, uh, people that really know what is beneficial for us, what is hurting us. Um, nobody's out to hurt, like nobody wants to scare people, I, I don't believe, you know, unless you're a conspiracy theorist, they're, you know, um, but I, I really think that people need to start entrusting um, in the experts that are really trying to change our ways um, to drive health in a better direction because it's just it's just going to hell in a handbag right now. I mean, I just watched this documentary and I'm like, I I don't even know how we're going to survive. Um, so yeah, I, I I would just I would encourage people to. Um, Get out of social media, get out of the news, uh, start digging into information that comes from the source um, and, and be your own advocate for the information and not just uh, allow misinformation um, or just bad information to come to you. Um, because I, I think knowledge is power and we are robbed of it as a society because it costs money and where it's free, it's inundated with misinformation. And I don't know that we have the capacity um, to decipher for all that. And I think that's, you know, something where the government can step in. I think there should be more public service announcements and um, more information given to the masses that is accurate and reliable. 